Well, thank you so much for the kind introduction. Uh, and I'm, I'm really honored and glad to be back in uh, Stellenbosch, uh, although in a virtual way. Um, uh, you might know or might not know that uh, my last real lecture was in Stellenbosch at well, uh, as well. A few days later, uh, the, the pandemic uh, restrictions occurred. Uh, and until then, uh, we are having lectures uh, on screen by Zoom or Teams or whatever. What I have on the menu today is 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 a lot, uh, but you've given me a lot of time, so I'd like to uh, use it uh, in, in a good way, but I'd like to do it interactively. The idea was that you could interrupt me at, at any specific moment during my lecture, and then we could uh, exchange and interact. Uh, but the, there seems to be some functional problem here, so I will stop after every part of my talk and then we can have some interaction and after that we, we go on. That's that's the idea. This is on the menu, a few background remarks uh, and then five topics I'd like to draw your attention to. Selective reporting, perverse incentives, retractions and how to handle them how to assess researchers and how to improve research climate uh, in, in your uh, research organization. So this is on the menu and after selective reporting and the others, um, I, I will stop uh, for, for interaction. Um, and, and all of you, you will get a PDF of the presentation uh, if you're interested in that. Uh, it will probably also on the website somewhere. And below the slides are my references, so you, you can always find your way back to the literature uh, which I'm citing during my presentation. Now let's start with the, 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 the core dilemma, the mother of all dilemmas, so to say, that, that uh, researchers have. And that core dilemma is that what is good for truth finding and trust in research is not always good for your academic career. It might be better for your academic career uh, to have highly cited uh, publications and you get them by being positive uh, and being spectacular. Uh, but that's not what research always is about. So translated in a simplified way, and I should warn you that is a simplification, it, it might run like this. Um, we love positive results a lot. Um, in fact, hardly anything else as positive results are published in the current literature. Um, and that has a reason. The reason is that you get easily uh, in high impact uh, journals. You are cited a lot with spectacular and positive results. And if you're lucky, you get media attention. And all these three, they lead to your next grants. And if you want to stay in academia to tenure in, in the longer run. So there is a lot of pressure to get positive results. Uh, and the good news in a cynical way is that there are many ways to cut corners um, uh, or worse, and we call that questionable research practices or research misconduct to get these positive results. In fact, these are wonderful tools to get positive results. And that's the only aim uh, that, that people are using it for that. But these positive results are false then, of course, and the pressure, personal pressure, and sometimes also funder pressure to engage in cutting corners uh, to get uh, with the purpose to get positive results, that needs to be restricted and resisted. Uh, and that brings me to, to the last uh, slide, I believe, of my introduction, now the, the, the one before that. This is an interesting article, although it's 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 rather a black story. These are two evolutionary biologists and and they do a, a, a clever game of, of modeling that shows that bad science has selective advantages. So if you in the current system, it makes sense to cut corners and cheat a little bit uh, because then you come up in your academic career quicker. Um, and of course we need to tweak the system and to tweak our own behavior uh, substantially uh, to avoid this. This is not a selective pressure we want, of course. We don't want to have bad science and advantage. We want to have good science to have an advantage, of course. So basically, 
we need a moral compass as as researchers and and here that compass is it's turning around a little bit uh, and it depends of course uh, on the virtuousness of the individual now there is not much i believe we can do about that um, after uh, a bringing has been finished but what what we can do things about is the research climate and the incentives uh, in the system of research. And mainly my talk will focus on research climate that will come at the end and proper incentives and that will come first. So that is what I would like to say about uh, introducing the, the topic, giving the background, and I'd like to move on to selective reporting now, if you allow me. Now, and I'll start with 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 one of my favorite slides, I should say this. This is a really interesting slide, I believe, um, but it tells an awful story. I, I should admit what we see here are 105 randomized clinical trials at the level of the FDA uh, and, and the trials are about drugs for depression against placebo. Uh, and 105 trials have been submitted to the FDA and they judge these trials because they need to make a decision whether your drug can enter the market or not. So everyone is submitting their data, their protocols, their everything to, do, to, to the FDA. The FDA is not reading your papers, they're only studying your data and your study protocol. And according to the FDA, and this is the gold standard, so to say, half of that 105 trials is positive in the sense that the, the new drug wins um, and other half is negative in the sense that there is no difference or the uh, placebo wins. Uh, this is as close to reality as we can, can come and hopefully you recognize that usually you don't get that far. Usually you don't have that gold standard because you don't have study protocols which are uh, pre-registered. You don't have full data sets. You are unable to check this. Normally you see this and this is what you see. A few years down the line, um, almost all, one exception of the positive uh, trials have been published and roughly half of the negative ones. We call that publication bias and this is already an important distortion of the real picture, but it gets worse. Um, as you know, people are measuring a lot in research and, and when you do so, you can pick and choose, uh, choose and cherry pick uh, among the results you get for your papers. Uh, and when you like positive results, you can leave out the negative results and that is what being made visible here. Many of these negative studies, according to the FDA, become, uh, it's like a miracle, they become positive in the publications just because they flip some outcomes, leave out some outcomes, and they tell a story in a much more positive way than what the FDA uh, uh, decided about that study. So hardly any negativity less. And then we should realize that uh, when you write papers, you use words and with words you can give spin to what you say, making it more positive, making it more negative, downplaying it a little bit. And then at least you can shred doubt on the remaining uh, negative uh, studies. They become yellow or orange or whatever, uh, or, or pink maybe, and hardly anything negative remains in the published literature. And, and look at the difference between these two. And I'm so afraid that this is what we face, that it's not only for, for the trials on, on uh, drugs against oppression, it, it is all over the place. And one step further, when you go to the next generation of publication and you look at the citations, you see that the positive studies are cited three to five times as often as the negative studies. So now negativity almost completely disappeared. And when you're looking in this domain, and when you say, well, let, let us redo the study and look whether we find the same, eh, the, the replication game, uh, you shouldn't be surprised th that you, you find uh, less often a positive outcome than you would expect on the basis of the literature. And that is the root of the replication crisis uh, we are facing. Uh, 
in, in basically in all disciplinary fields. It has been uh, starting uh, in, in animal research and, and psychology, uh, but now it has been studied in many, many more fields. Uh, and talking about the causes of replicability crisis, um, I alluded already to the, rep, the selective reporting. Eh? That's what I just discussed. Uh, equally uh, low power, you can understand that, of course, when you do many studies which are small, you can just ignore the studies you don't like the outcomes of and just publish the studies you do like the outcome of, and you get a completely distorted picture in the literature again. Um, low rate of true effects, that's a bit more complex, but maybe you can understand that already in, in two, in two of the early uh, p-hacking, that is what my favorite biostatistician always said. If you torture your data enough, they will always confess. And finally, also harking, hypothesizing after results are known that uh, may lead to weird papers. Uh, you just have data and then you start fantasizing about what they might mean uh, and, and you write a nice, nice story around it. That's, that's still happening a lot. It's completely wrong, but it's still happening a lot. Uh, you need to uh, formulate your hypothesis before you collect data and before you analyze data and before you write your paper, of course. Now, this king uh, understood the trick as well. He shoots his arrows at the wall and he hits the bullet all the time. Quite spectacular. Now, this brings me to, to, to the main course of, of this uh, uh, interactive exercise, and, and that is that uh, we should utilize, I believe, open methods, open codes, and open data more often. Not because they are a magic bullet. They don't solve all the problems, and they bring their own problems, of course, and, and possibly in the discussion we will dwell on, the, on these, but they help a lot to uh, improve transparency. When you have research protocols that have been posted on, on the web before the data collection started, you can always go back to the plans these, these investigators had and check whether they did what they promised and whether they reported everything they measured. And this helps to make a study replicable in the sense that it can be replicated. The recipe is there. Um, we try to replicate a lot of studies without a recipe, and, and that's that's really difficult because when there is no study protocol, you cannot redo a study, um, and when there is no data set, you cannot reanalyze the data. And, and that's another thing, open data, having your data available for everyone after the study, uh, that enables reanalysis. And also, it is an, a thing of efficiency. Other people can reuse your data, pulled or not pulled with other data um, and answer different research questions by them, which, which is good as well, of course. And then having it all open, methods and codes and data helps to detect selective reporting. I alluded to that already, to help to detect p-hacking because your data analysis protocol should be uploaded before you start looking at your data as well, of course. And it detects harking because your hypothesis should be in your study protocol, which was written before data collection started. So it, it helps enormously to, to detect cutting corners. It might prevent cutting corners um, and it makes transparency um, the, the coin of, of research. Uh, I like the open science movement. It's, it's a bit like a sect, of course, uh, and, and, and yes, there are disadvantages but there are many, many advantages as well. And that's the reason I also like the top guidelines, the transparency and openness uh, practices guidelines. Uh, this is, is, is uh, introduced by the Center for Open Science. Um, I will repeat that name several times, uh, possibly. And it's also coming with the top factor, uh, and, and that is a scoring scheme for it. And it's a clever scheme. Um, it, it consists of um, eight standards, uh, journals, uh, research journals um, can subscribe to on different levels, on four different levels. And, and level zero is basically doing nothing. Uh, so you can join the top guidelines without doing that much. 
uh, which is nice. And and uh, yes, they do have already 5,000 signatories. But the idea is, of course, and, and all these journals have these ambitions or are doing it already to get further. For instance, data transparency. Uh, you should not only encourage to share data, you should state whether or not the data are available. That's level one. And level two is you, you should have it uh, uh, available or explain why it is not available for legal or ethical constraints. That's possible as well. Um, and then the highest level is that it is available, it is submitted with your article, and at the office of the journal, they are redoing your data analysis to check whether you did it correctly. And you can have that not only for data, you can have it only a pre-registration I alluded to already, data analysis plan, um, uh, and so on and so forth. So please um, consider this type of journal when uh, you want uh, to submit a paper to. It's, it's, it's a sign that the journal is serious. Um, this is the Center of Open Science again. Uh, they run pre-registration, eh? that's basically the idea I just alluded to. You, you upload your study protocol before you start data collecting. And a better version of that, in a way, is the registered report. I, I, eh, the, registered, uh, the registration is explained in this paper, uh, and then I come to the registered report. Um, this is a nice paper by Brian Nosek. Uh, maybe you should consider reading it. And it explains why it is so important to pre-register your study. And he, he go, uh, goes at, as far, and I agree, that you, you, you statistics don't mean that much if you don't do this. Only when you have clear hypothesis, testing hypothesis makes sense. When you don't have clear hypothesis, you can test until the cow comes home, the cows come home, uh, and you find always a, a, a statistical significant finding. That doesn't matter. That doesn't matter, and that doesn't mean anything. And he discriminates between prediction and postdiction, which I like. And this might be the last or the penultimate slides uh, before our first uh, short uh, interactive part. Uh, so please bear with me. Uh, and this is on, on my my favorite idea of registered reports. I, I, I love this a lot. Uh, the idea is so simple and, and so good that I'm, I'm just jealous that I didn't made, made it up myself. Uh, the simplistic idea is as follows. You, when you want to do a study, you start writing an introduction paragraph and, and a, a complete uh, study design method paragraph. And these two you submit to a journal. You have no data, you have no results, you have nothing. The journal decides on that basis, the introduction and the, 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 the method paragraph, whether the study uh, will be published. And, and they can judge whether it's, it's relevant, it's interesting, and whether the design is, is all right, whether it's well done. So they are not, the reviewers, the editors, no one is distracted by the results of the studies because there are no results. So away goes selective reporting. And then there is a bonus. Um, I'm a methodologist, so I, I made my whole career the stupid mistake to make critical remarks on study methods uh, when I was peer reviewing manuscripts. That was stupid in hindsight because nothing can be done anymore when the study is done. Uh, but at this stage, when you make uh, constructive remarks and criticism on the study method, yes, you can improve the study methods. Yes, you can tweak around your study because you have not yet started. You can change it, resubmit it, and when it's finally accepted, all the peer reviewers and the editor agrees that this is the best way to study this and it's important to study. Now then you do your work, you collect your data, you write your report uh, after data analysis, you submit it again, reviewers check whether you did what you promised and then it's published. This is the idea of registered report and it's wonderful. This is avant-garde, only 250, a little bit more maybe nowadays, journals are doing this out of 35, 40,000 uh, uh, research journals. So there is room for improvement uh, again, but it's a wonderful idea. Uh, and the first evaluation uh, results are available. They, they both come from preprints. 
Um, one is coming uh, from uh, a preprint that has been published a few days ago only, um, and it shows that when you have registered reports, uh, that's this bar, and you compare that with, with a matched standard report on, on, on the same topics, of course, but not registered reports, you see that 95% or even more is positive. Uh, that, that means positive uh, in the sense that uh, it supports the, the most important hypothesis of a study and the registered reports uh, less than half is positive. And, and that convinces me that yes, this is indeed a killer for selective publication and publication bias. And that's wonderful because we needed that. And another study looks at the, the, the methods of registered reports um, and compare them with uh, called here non-registered reports. It's the same as standard reports there, of course. Uh, and these are effect sizes. And you see that all are on the good sides, uh, methodological rigor, quality of the methods, uh, what we can learn from it, uh, quality of the question, uh, and then it becomes less statistically significant, but it is a matter. The point estimates are all on the right side, showing that registered reports are not only uh, less often uh, overly optimistic, but also better quality. Uh, I like that. Uh, and my advice to you and to your institute is uh, please consider using this format of registered report because it's it's a leap forward. Really. This is fair data. That's another aspect of, 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 of being open and clear, making your data findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. Um, it's gaining a lot of traction nowadays and, and, and many funders um, make it mandatory to, to follow the, the, the FAIR principles. They're rather well known, so I won't dwell long of, on them. But for, for um, empirical research using data, it, it, it is a, a leap forward as well. These are the parking lots for your um, study protocols and your data sets. Um, I mentioned already the Open Science Framework of the Center of Open Science. Dataverse is, is quite popular um, in, in continental Europe at least. Elsevier has Mendeley that's working quite well. It's for free. I'm sure they, they found out a way to make money out of it, but, but it's, it's good service. In North America, Dryad and Figshare seem to be a little bit more popular. Um, and in, in total, we have more than 2000. So please don't start your own your own data repository. Um, that is not that useful uh, because the data repository you need, it's already there uh, and you only need to find it. This is the thing of preprints. Preprints are gaining traction enormously nowadays, and, and that is because preprints, uh, they have been so popular with COVID-19 research. We, we were in a hurry. We are we're under time pressure. So everyone started preprints. The, the rise has been spectacular. They're around for, for 20 plus years, started in, in physics, natural sciences, but now in biomedical science and psychology, they're, they're quite uh, a positive. Last counting, uh, a few weeks ago, we, we published in, in JAMA a, a paper about it. Last counting was that we now have uh, 65 preprints, uh, some small, some some much much bigger, um, and uh, the, the volume of preprints is is rising spectacularly. If you're interested, uh, these are two blogs I I, I was a co-author on uh, recently published on what is happening to research integrity um, under pressure. Um, and, and why are preprints uh, problematic in, in some ways and, and how can you improve them? Uh, and um, I, I just made a false promise. I had a few more slides in, on, on my deck before the break, but I'm, I'm getting near. Um, please bear me with me. Uh, these are the ways to improve preprint quality. Um, a guidance for author is is lacking. We we diagnosed that in that JAMA uh, uh, paper I just alluded to, and and the reference is below. Uh, it is unclear um, whether a, 
a version is published later on or not. So the link should be there and that's the responsibility of the preprint server, of course. And the author should take preprints serious in the sense that they take as much care to employ responsible research practices as in the real thing, which is important. And, and there is already some research that shows that uh, the published versions are not that different from, from the preprints. So preprints on average seem to be pretty good as well or, or as bad as, as peer reviewed papers, you can say as well, of course. Um, it, the idea of preprints is that you get commands before you submit your paper and it's out in the open for your colleagues to, to, to learn from. Be active, look at them, uh, give reviews. The funny thing is that most people do that on Twitter, which, which has advantages, but also some disadvantages, of course. Not all preprint servers have, have a, 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 a well-functioning uh, method to offer your commands yet, but that needs to be improved as well. Um, and like in every study, you should be clear about your strengths and limitations, of course, of preprints. Okay, this seems to be a nice moment um, for an interactive break and it might be a good idea to stop screen sharing here. Uh, I give the floor, I guess, to Whitney or Marek. Uh, thank you, thank you, Prof. Whitney, um, were you able to see if there are any questions on the chat? Currently no questions, so they can raise their hands if they have any questions. Good. Uh, colleagues, the floor is open. Um, I see Prof. Eugene has a question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Mareka. Um, just in terms of the preview of the methodology uh, before you, in fact, start embarking on the study without any results on that slide of yours, uh, Professor Bota. Um, the, the question I have is, I mean, this could essentially also help to find funding for the research if they know that the methodology has been pre-approved by a journal. Uh, in some cases, of course, uh, by the time that you want to do this, you have already got the funding based on a project proposal, uh, and that then might be, you know, sort of too late to go for this pre-approval of the methodology. Uh, what is your view on this? I mean, this could help both ways, I think, but I'd like yeah. your view on uh, well, it's it's an interesting question. Uh, thank you for that. And 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 that is one of the the points uh, that have not been st stabilized completely. Uh, what is the right moment uh, to uh, to to engage in a registered report? Is that before uh, asking for a grant for a study? Is that after getting a grant for the study? Is it for before going to the med medical ethic improvement, or should you do after it? Uh, there are pros and cons of everything. Um, the truth is probably that it's too early to engage in a residence report until it, it's too late. And that is the reason most likely that the time window people perceive is so narrow. Um, the uptake of residence reports so far is, is disappointing because like, like we all know, you're never too early. Research projects. Normally, you run too late, uh, and and you get stressed about that, and then waiting for review and approval of your resident's report is not a nice thing to do. So, so many people consider it but decide not to do it. Um, and I like your idea of a market, uh, the, the, a market uh, where funders can pick from accepted resident's report what they want to fund and and what not. Uh, you see that happening with preprints, for instance, as well. One of the first preprints I was involved with a few years ago, uh, within 24 hours, we got uh, an email uh, from an editor in chief of a, of a journal we would love to publish the paper in, whether we would please submit that this interesting piece of work to her paper, which we did. So it's so nice to to be invited by an editor to to upload your stuff uh, to their journal instead of begging for a place in that journal. Uh, and the same happens in in replicability. There is now an an an, an a market organized by a lady in San Francisco, really cleverly done, where proposals for replication go to the to the best offer. So it's it's a kind of tendering market uh, they, they make for it. So first there is a proposal I want, funders say, I want this study to be replicated 
and then you can tender when you want to do that. So, so there might be progress in that direction, but it's 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 well, it's it's really in the future. It's quite exciting. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Baldur. Good. We've got another question from Mura Haini. Good morning, Lex. How are you? Yeah, um, I, I think this idea of registered reports is a really good one. Um, I suppose it's not quite the same thing, but very similar um, in that on the uh, HRB Open, which is an open publishing platform that we have, we uh, allow people to publish their protocols, which is, so it's a, it's a very similar approach. And in fact, for the COVID-19 rapid response call, we made it mandatory for people to publish their protocols within two months of receiving funding. The advantage of this is we had to peer review so quickly for these calls. They, I mean, we had to completely truncate the whole process that having people publish the protocols gave us a second bite at peer review and it made sure, you know, where we felt that perhaps people hadn't fully thought through the protocols in the beginning. And so the peer reviewers for the original funding didn't have a chance to really explore what they were planning to do. They were just getting kind of the top line. This really gave people a chance to think about the protocols before they publish them, but then also for those protocols to be peer reviewed so that at least within the project, we were able to improve the quality. So I think um, certainly for rapid review, and I think we'll probably be seeing more and more of that in, into the future, uh, pre-registration or a protocol publication on an open publishing platform is definitely the way to go. So thank yeah. you for bringing that up. Yeah, well, th thank you, Mara, and I, I fully agree to what you say. It's so nice that funding agencies are doing these things, and and yes, having protocols out in the open, uh, even when it's not a registered report, is a big advantage and an opportunity to improve your study b before uh, the, the the data are being collected. So, so I, I like the rhythm uh, very much. And in the past, you had journals that published protocol, but usually they were so slow that your whole study was done. Um, uh, before your protocol was studied, that didn't help it at all, of course. Thanks. I'm going to take one more question um, for now. Uh, it's from Minri Griev. Two, <laughs> two quick questions. One, you sound as though it's much more quantitative in nature. What's the experience with qualitative research? And the second one is, to what extent does it protect the the, the researchers' thoughts and ideas um, on this level? It's a wonderful question. Thank you so much. Uh, the, the first one, um, it, it's true that it, it all started with uh, quantitative research. Uh, but the good news is that now the Center of Open Science uh, one of my PhD students went there for, for three, four months and and she did the Delphi study uh, sorting out how to pre-register qualitative studies. And that was a really neat study. It, I don't think it's below my slide, but please send me an email and then I can give you the reference to the preprint. And the Center of Open Science is now programming that opportunity, so they will offer a really nicely structured way to pre-register qualitative research in the future. Now, the second thing, um, th there are whether um, you, you, other people will steal your, your brilliant ideas when, when you have them pre-registered. There are several answers to that, and, and I, I'll try to keep it brief. One answer is that, um, well, research is not about you, it's about something bigger. So who cares when someone else is using a good idea? Um, less idealistic, maybe you could say by having a pre registered protocol or a preprint, uh, you establish to be the first because all these things are timestamped and you can never change the timestamp anymore. So you can prove priority if that is important for you. That's not a problem. And the third answer is in, in, in virtually all these repositories, you can set an embargo on the data. Um, you can say, well, this is only open after one year or half a year or five years. You can all do that. So when you embargo it, it's, it's time stamped in the cyberspace. No one can read it, but it's there and you can always prove that you were the first. 
Uh, thanks, Prof. I think we can continue now uh, with the next section um, and we'll have another opportunity for questions later on. Great, great, great. Let's move on to this one. Uh, and and um, my attention was uh, by this paper a, a, a while ago. It was last year, I believe. Yeah, it, it was last year. Um, and then I started asking questions to, to people in, in South Africa, and that happens in many other countries and continents, of course. And it turned out that an important parameter uh, in the government uh, fi financing of, of your university is from the ministry, from the government, the number of publications. And you have to be on the list. It's complex, of course, but basically it's the number of publication that is the main driver of the university budget, is my understanding. And, and that paper publication um, th that, uh, according to what I was able to dig out in the literature, which was not much, I, I found three or four papers um, that explained to me that different universities handle this differently. Some universities uh, uh, keep it uh, at university level uh, and don't translate paper publication lower in the organization to the faculty, the department, the research group, and even some universities do that to the personal bank accounts. That it it, it becomes a bonus when you, when you have many publications uh, and and you can buy a new car uh, if if you want from it. Uh, and I believe that especially when you translate it deep into the organization, this can be a strong behavioral incentives. It's it's enormously strong. Um, and, and like all strong incentives, uh, there are advantages and, and disadvantages, of course. Now, th the attended effects, and, and that has been documented in many countries and also in your country, I believe, is that when this is what you do, you get more publications. Of course, you get more publications. It, it works wonderfully for that. The, the sky is the limit, it goes up and it never stops going up. But it, it might also work well for a few unintended, unintended effects. And that is on the domain of the perverse incentives I've been alluding to earlier. Um, and what you do, of course, is you focus on quantity. Uh, not on quality. There, there is. I could not detect a quality adjustment in in the whole scheme. Uh, that wouldn't be easy, of course. But I couldn't detect an attempt, and that is how it's usually being done in 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 the uh, in the financing. Now we have something similar in my country, in the Netherlands. The number of PSDs is important for the the the, the funding for the university. And yes, since that was introduced. Uh, we are making three, four, five times as many uh, PhD theses as, as we used to do in the past. So it works if, if you have a parameter, but you don't reward quality, you reward quantity. And yes, and I, I found some, some articles uh, 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 well, more or less proving that, documenting that, uh, that when you do it this way, when you have paper publication, uh, you get more plagiarism and duplicate publication because plagiarized and duplicate publication, as long as they're not detected, uh, they bring in the bonus as well. Uh, and it might be a temptation to do salami slicing, to, to look how small the smallest unit, unit of research is. You can publish separately in a paper because when you write up a, a study in five papers, it brings you five bonuses instead of one when you combine all the results in one paper. It, it might be tempting to, to do gift authorship. Um, for instance, with a colleague in another university, you give each other free rights on your papers and, and, and everyone is, is becoming richer because papers are counting for the universities, for different universities. And then it might be tempting to engage in the use of predatory open access journals. Now, open access, that sounds nice. Eh? Open is nice. Uh, I've, I've been alluding to that and open access is also nice. Uh, but predatory means that um, they make money. That's a business model by mimicking serious journals that they, they sometimes even mimic, mimic their websites. Um, they offer peer review, but they don't deliver serious uh, uh, value for money. 
uh, and they publish your papers uncritically overnight. Uh, and when they count, they count. Uh, uh, I know that on your list, uh, not uh, there is an attempt to remove predatory journals, but that is not easy to uh, remove all predatory journals uh, from the list. Uh, Matthew affects the the well. That's from from uh, from the Bible, of course. Uh, the the rich will be uh, made richer by this scheme. Um, equity will be uh, uh, smaller, uh, for reasons you can imagine. Uh, and you don't award responsible research practices. All these open science practices and other responsible research practices they take time. Curating your data, uploading them somewhere enabling other people to make sense out of it, it takes a lot of time. It, it leads to no publication, it needs to no bonus. So why should you do that? So basically, wh when um, an, an incentive, uh, when the measure uh, becomes too important and when the stakes are too high, uh, it, it can be a per perverse incentives. And, and that might have happened here uh, and that might need some reflection as well. Uh, uh, we, we see that here as well uh, on, on this cartoon. That's the same idea. Huh? We started a few years ago with the, the mandatory publishing, which was a good idea. And then it became publish or pe perish, uh, which might also be a good idea. And then it was published in high impact journals or perish. And now we seem to be in the domain that you need to frequently publish in high impact journals and maybe then you won't perish. Uh, at least that is the feeling that many postdocs and I know and other early career scientists have uh, uh, about their uh, prognosis in academia. Uh, and this all leads to publication pressure. Um, we studied that a few years ago in uh, in Amsterdam, um, two universities, two university medical centers. Uh, everyone um, was invited to our survey. I will do that survey later on a little bit as well, most likely because it was basically on research climate. Um, but but this was perceived publication pressure. And yes, the perceived publication pressure was high. Particularly among postdocs and assistant professors, they are still depending on the tenure and the track record in university heavily on their publication success. Publication pressure uh, happens in all disciplinary fields, but it seems to be the highest in the humanities. We, we did focus group interviews as, as well, and there it turned out that having so little time in the humanities to do research and to write papers um, anyway, and also to, to be forced in, in, in chablons that, that fits more the natural sciences than the humanities, that is stressful for, for people there, and, and I sympathize with that. Um, and then the third result from our study is that uh, we need really to, to work on a healthy uh, publication climate. And it takes many to tango. It takes a government, it takes leadership in university, it takes people on, on the ground, your supervisors, department heads, uh, what have you. It takes funding agencies, it takes journals to play the part. So we should solve this issue together. And we need to incentivize each other for doing the right thing, to having high quality papers uh, and, and acting with integrity and, and responsible research practices. That is important. And in the other study we, we did, I have no slide on that, even medical professors uh, had a high publication pressure. They were professor already, but still when they perceived high publication pressure, they have also a lot of symptoms of burnout. So it seems to be that uh, it's 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 quite over the top and, and we should be toning down. And that can be done. Um, our faculty of, of, of um, economy, uh, uh, maybe five, six years ago, had the courageous decision. They say, well, uh, we are only going to look uh, to your best five papers in your last five years when we evaluate you. And that was a clear message. Uh, and we look at the quality of that paper. Of course, we also look in which journals they are, but we ignore the rest. And in that faculty, the number of papers went in, in a kind of free. Uh, and the, 
the number of papers in in the journals that are really prestigious uh, and and considered to be high quality in that field, they went up. There are disadvantages, of course, but I I'm only telling you that uh, incentives matter, uh, and you better need think very carefully uh, about the effects they might have, and and then avoiding the unintended effects is always uh, the most important. Maybe short break, break again for discussion, uh, if you like, because I, I, I'm, I'm about to skip to the next topic. Uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, OK, so we open up the floor again. Uh, before that, perhaps Whitney, any questions on the chat? Nothing, Marika. Great. So colleagues, you can just raise your hand if you've got any specific questions at this stage. Prof. Eugene. Thanks. Thank you very much. And I think uh, you really point out, Professor Boter, a lot of pitfalls here uh, in terms of incentives, and, and thank you for that. But I also would think, you know, that ultimately the, uh, the, the proof of the pudding is in the quality of the paper itself. Uh, you know, and that, that should be the ultimate measure and uh, not necessarily the, the numbers. Uh, and if there are numbers, if the quantity is also there, again, the proof of the pudding would be in the quality of the publication itself. Uh, <clears throat> that that should uh, deal to a large extent with uh, perversive uh, incentives, in, in my view. And I'd, I'd like to hear what you say about this. Yeah, well, uh, thank you for that comment. And, and I fully agree, of course. Uh, quality is important, uh, but quality is different. It Quality is, is, is difficult. It's in the eye of the beholder to some extent. Uh, it, it takes time. You need to read papers to, to be able to judge the quality. Um, and and it's it's not popular. I can understand that that counting citations and looking at impact factors became so popular. And, and I like it, and I still like it, and I liked it much more in the past myself as well. But I've come to the view that it, it, it has some unintended uh, consequences. Um, and I'll give you one example, maybe. Uh, like some of you may know, I've been a rector of my university for seven years, and, and then you are um, in charge of, of professorships and new deans and, and stuff like that. And it happened to me many times that we convened a committee for a new appointment and then one, typically one of the members, typically more, they just Googled the, the, the candidates and they said, well, this is interesting. Uh, there are two with a really high HIRSCH index. Let's invite them for a talk and forget about the rest. And, and then they want to, to, to end the meeting uh, by saying this. And it was not easy to always draw attention to the fact that here's index might not be the only uh, and, and maybe even not the best predictor of success as a dean of, of, of an department head or, or a new professor leading a group. So looking at the quality is important. It, it's now moving uh, luckily in, in, in good directions. Uh, um, in my country, and it might happen have happened in your country as well. I apologize for that. I, I don't know the the rules that well in your country. In my country, a few years ago, the 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 NRF, the National Science Foundation uh, Research Foundation, they forbid the mentioning of uh, impact factor and here's index uh, in grant applications, and they asked for a narrative. Why is your research important? Explain. And what are your three best papers? Add the PDFs. And, and then the committee's judging were in that way forced to focus on quality and uh, as good as possible forced to ignore quantity. Uh, but I don't have the illusion that this solves the issue, but it, it, it is an improvement, I believe, and it shows the way uh, we should go together. More narratives, more interpretation, um, less is more in that sense. Uh, thank you. We've got another question from um, Stefanie van der Burgt. Yes, um, good uh, afternoon, uh, Lex. Um, it's, it's not really a question. I just had um, a small remark regarding um, changing incentives. 
which I think is is um, is great and an, is an evolution that we we should definitely uh, proceed further. Um, but changing incentives also means that we influence the lives of our researchers quite dramatically because it sometimes feels like we are changing the rules of the game as we go on. And of course, that is necessary if we want to go to change and uh, if we want to uh, focus more on quality than quantity. So I, I don't question that, but I think it is very uh, difficult for especially young researchers because um, they, they get into a very insecure position. They have to step into a new system um, where they don't know where it will lead to. Um, they, they have to leave um, the dominant uh, structure, so to speak, um, of which they are sure that if they follow that, that they will get uh, positions and that they will get grants and things like that. Um, so we, we kind of ask them to step in the, in, into this very insecure future, um, future structure where, where they don't know uh, if it will be a success for them uh, yeah. or not. Um, yeah, and I, I think that that's, that's very difficult and a lot to yeah. ask from our researchers. Yeah, well, th thank you, Stephanie, for this comment. Uh, I, I fully agree. And, and, and you cannot do this alone. Um, uh, when you change it in, in one university, uh, people say correctly, uh, in addition to what you say, well, listen, my career is not in this university. Um, I'm a researcher. My career uh, field is worldwide. I want to go to Canada, to Australia, to South Africa, what have you. And, and why do you apply different rules uh, uh, as opposed to the rules that are universal? And they're right, of course. Uh, one example, um, Utrecht University medical faculty, uh, the dean of that in, in my country, he, he was ahead of the, of the pack in, in, that, in the sense that he changed the rules quite spectacularly uh, of, of appointment of professors and, and, and tenure tracks. And people were so angry. They were not disputing that he was doing the right thing, but they said, well, listen, you are changing the, the, the rules of the game. It makes us insecure and you spoil our career opportunities outside these universities. And, and that dean, he, he is now not a dean anymore. Uh, the question he, he got most often was, when will you retire? In other words, I, I can wait for one more year, but but this should go away. Luckily, it doesn't go away, and and now other universities, and and uh, at least in my country and in a uh, European continent, are trying to pick up. Changing these things will be slow. Uh, there will be some early adopters. There will be some late adopters, and and the majority is 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 slowly starting to make these changes from quantity to quality. Uh, but yes, Stephanie, you're, you're right. We, we should don't overdo it uh, and, and, and risk uh, the career opportunities of, of our early career scientists. Uh, last question, um, Minri. Um, thank you. I want to uh, agree with you so much during the Research Integrity Conference where this Dean spoke and indicated what he did and made the changes. And the big problem that we have is exactly that we facing that funding organizations, everybody doesn't follow the change of how to assess a researcher for career promotion and, and things like that, which makes it very complicated. Yeah, yeah, I, I fully agree. I fully agree. But 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 I'm an optimistic person. Uh, to, to me, the glass is half full as well. Um, as as we speak, uh, this work, uh, uh, the, the, the Global Research Council convenes on on the web as well, and and they have published a few days ago a beautiful report on the assessment of research and researchers and research groups, and they're moving in this direction very much as well. So we need, we need to do it together. Um, um, and some people will be earlier and some will be a bit later, but uh, there seems to, to be a growing consensus uh, where to head. Uh, thank you, Prof. Right, okay. I think we can go on to the next part.
Okay, let me give it a try. That should work. There we are. Um, that's about rejection and corrections. Um, now, this is the most infamous uh, scientist from the Netherlands, I, I guess a guy called Diederik Stapel. Um, he fabricated data. Uh, he was kind to his BSD students. He gave them data that hardly ever happens uh, by a supervisor, but these data were faked. So the guy um, was was in Tilburg University. It started in in a way the awareness of of research integrity issues in in my country. At least it accelerated it. Uh, and in that sense, it was a blessing in disguise. And, and also for his university, they're doing wonderful stuff there uh, uh, because they were they are so afraid to repeat these things. They don't want, want that, of course. So it, it, it helps. Um, Diederik has the, 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 the sad record of being number fifth um, uh, in, uh, as the number of rejections are concerned, 58 rejections. Uh, the world champion uh, is, 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 is away above it was 183, uh, but still this is a lot of rejections. Uh, some of us may not, may not even have 58 papers and he has 58 rejections. And rejections is, is important to me because it's a way to clean the track record of, of no, knowledge progress. Uh, and, and we need to take that seriously. And, and I believe that we need to take it more seriously than we do nowadays. And that's the reason I attract your attention to, to the, the, the block of retraction watch. It's excellent. They're, they're, they're delivering excellent services. Uh, um, and, and they also promoted uh, this graph. It's, it's from a presentation by, by some clever researchers. And what they plot here is an index for the number of retractions against the impact factor of the journals. And surprise, surprise, the, the, the big five um, are um, high in the sense high impact factor and also a high number of rejections. Now the point is that I don't know what that means and, and I guess that no one knows what that means because it might mean um, yes that many people cut corners or worse to get into these journals. Uh, that might be one reason. Another reason might be that papers in these journals are more scrutinized and when something is seriously wrong, it will be detected earlier uh, and that would be a good thing. And it might also be that these journals take rejections more seriously in the sense that they respond sooner. Uh, and 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 taken all together, it's, it's not evidence based what I'm, not, I'm about to say now, I believe that uh, the rising numbers of retractions, uh, and that is what we see over time, is not alarming. It, it, to me, it means that we watch it better and, and we are carefully and we take cleaning the, the track record of published literature more seriously. But then, of course, in the ideal world, a retraction would uh, hardly ever happen and would uh, not be necessary due to questionable research practices or research misconduct. The same retraction watch is also running a database of retractions. Uh, uh, all the papers of Diederik Stapel, uh, the, these are the 58 papers, are, are, are in there and you can check where they are, you, you can click on them, you can see them and so on and so forth. There is some, some nice and intriguing research on the causes of retraction. This, the, the base of this is, is not retraction watch, but the, the web of science retractions. And you see that roughly one quarter is uh, fraud, uh, fabrication or falsification. Uh, one quarter is error, and, and let's assume that these are unintentional errors, so that's that's a completely different category. Uh, one third, uh, uh, one one quarter as well is is plagiarism because duplicate publication is a form of plagiarism as well, of course. Um, so. One third is plagiarism, and and the rest is uh, uh, categorized among these these things. And I want to allude only to this one, to fake review. That's that in a, in a sad way a, a, a funny phenomenon, and it 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 was in vague uh, a number of years ago, more strongly than now, I believe, because journals know about it. Um, and, and it arose from the opportunity that um, when you submit a paper, you're often asked to um, 
to suggest a few reviewers. And, and when you mention a few famous colleagues in your field, um, the likelihood that these reviewers will be approached is substantial. And, and then when you, you can easily make uh, an Hotmail or an Gmail email account on that name, uh, leading to your own uh, uh, computer, of course, and not to that famous person. Uh, so then basically you can review your own paper when that reviewer is selected. Uh, and that became quite popular. Uh, it became popular specifically in countries that paper publication as well. Uh, China, Iran, uh, uh, Korea were quite famous uh, for, uh, infamous I should say, for faking peer review. It seems to be going down, although I don't uh, know the data completely, um, because the, the the serious journals they 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 took care uh, and they either stop with the habit of suggesting peer reviewers, or check carefully whether the email address provided is is a genuine email address. So many things are going on. Um, and there is room for improvement on the domain of rejection. I, I, I tried to explain already why I believe it is important, uh, but what we see is that journals are slow or very slow. They, they sometimes take years when the case is already closed, everything has been investigated and they still don't retract, which is awful. Um, journals are often reluctant to investigate. I can understand that. Many journals don't have the resources for that. And I believe that the employer, the university or the university medical center is responsible. Some journals um, and publishers think that authors, corresponding authors, or sometimes even all authors need to agree to retraction. And when authors don't agree, there will be no retraction, which is awful as well. <coughs> because of authors may not uh, like uh, their paper being retracted, of course. The root cause of the whole thing, I believe, is that there is no clear discrimination between cleansing the, the knowledge record, the published, uh, 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 the published record, um, and sanctioning for misconduct. Uh, universities typically want to sanction and to investigate thoroughly, and, that, and they take usually months and, and sometimes years. But journals, they need to retract papers immediately um, when it is clear that papers are flawed. <coughs> Sorry. Then you have these retraction notices that they are rather vague on average, uh, difficult to read, uh, vague terms, and that might be because journals and publishers especially are afraid for lawsuits. That doesn't help. And then um, there is the, the funny thing, which is, is not nice as well, that the, the, the number of citations to rejected papers, yes, it goes down, but not much. They're, they're still being cited. It, it, it still happens. Uh, there is now recently become, became available a piece of software and, and journals start using that software before publication to look whether there are rejected papers among the references. And, and that is a nice development. And then um, a, a very interesting thing is that um, there is also honorable self-retraction. You can discover a fatal flaw in your own paper or your colleague can point it out that there was an unintentional fatal flaw. And then you, you need to decide to retract your own paper. And you need, well, you deserve credit for that. You deserve to be rewarded in a sense uh, as being an honest uh, scientist. Uh, but you come in the whole bunch of uh, retractions due to research misconduct, and there are no clear labels uh, explaining that this retraction was uh, wonderful and that retraction was for awful reasons. Um, and this is a nice paper in, in a journal I, I like a lot, F1000 Research, uh, by a few uh, of, of the, 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 the few intelligent people from, from the publishing industry, and they have a really neat new taxonomy of um, being more uh, uh, modular uh, and clear about what the retraction and the correction uh, was caused by, which, which is a good idea, I believe. And I like this journal so much because it, it does everything right that you can do uh, right. 
it is a preprint server. So when you upload your manuscript, it's there. Uh, then there is peer review completely open. All the review reports are there. Your repetals are there. The next versions are there. And after a few rounds, typically the paper is accepted uh, and otherwise it's, it's stuck at the level where it is stuck. But when it is accepted, everything is still uh, clickable, available. Um, uh, the reviews get a DOI, so you give the reviewers credit for their work. The the, the reviewers uh, have, uh, are, are are being made citable without any additional work for you as a reviewer. And there is versioning. I like that as well. When one or two or ten years down the line, the author think, well, we'd like to update our article because uh, we discovered that something went wrong, or we have some 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 better some some better things to say. You can do so, and the whole family sticks together. This won't be possible on paper, of course, but it's it's wonderful on on uh, uh, in the digital arena of publication. Uh, and, and recently, I think it was yesterday, I, I saw a news uh, message that F1000 research has been selected by the European Union uh, as, as a preferred provider for publications of funded uh, research funded by the European Union, which will give an excellent push to even more improve their services. So also in the publication game, uh, the rules are changing. Uh, for some people, it's it, it's going to slow. For other people, it's going to quick. You might have seen this this piece in in Nature on Elizabeth Bick. Uh, she, she's quite interesting. She she has a gift to to see fake pictures, uh, to see duplications and distortions and research, uh, uh, reusing pictures. She. she does that for many years already. She does it on a full time basis now. There, there are a few more uh, of these people around uh, to check uh, fake illustrations. Um, and Elizabeth, she tells that in this nature piece as well. She said, well, um, I don't write to journals. I don't write to institutes. I don't write to authors anymore. She's thoroughly disappointed in, in the uptake and the response and, and the retraction rates. She says, I go to Puppier. And Puppier is, is a, a measure of disruptive innovation. Everyone can give comments on any publication on Puppier. You can do that under your name or, or not uh, add your name. And when you extend in your browser, uh, and all browsers can be extended in that way, the Puppier extension, then the comments will pop up when you look at the paper. No, no matter on which website it is, the pop-up will make sure that you see the Puppier command. So it's completely out of control of journals and editors and publishers. Uh, and, and that's the reason I label it as disruptive innovation. And it seems to work. It has some side effects as well, but uh, it's, it's, it's a nice experiment, I believe. Let's have a small break again. Uh, Prof. Lix, um, we've got about uh, 15 minutes left in total. Uh, would you like to break now or perhaps um, uh, you can uh, do a few more slides? Um, I'm sh there's, I think there's quite a few slides left, but if you want to perhaps identify a few that you would like to address in closure and then we can have a last um, perhaps 10, 8 to 10 minutes uh, final discussion before we close. Yeah, that would that would be all right. No, no problem. It's 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 your show. Am I still there? You are still here. Um, I think let's uh, perhaps um, the presentation is so valuable. I think let's see if we can do a few more slides and then do a final closing. OK, no, no, no problem. I'll do a few more slides and, and try to uh, keep some time for for final questioning and, 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 and remarks. No, no problem. I uh, should do this. So it, it's working again, isn't it? Assessment of researchers. Uh, well, we all know already that counting citations and publication has its uh, uh, limitations. We've been discussing that before. These are the, the sources of that. Last World Conference on Research Integrity, uh, we did the Hong Kong principles about how to assess researchers with a view to foster research integrity. 
um, and that is more open science and less citation and publication counting. Uh, uh, and assessing research, we do it quite often for grant applications, vacancy, promotion, tenures, and award, of course. These are these principles. Uh, we should assess responsible research practices, value complete respond, uh, reporting. Remember my story about selective reporting. Um, reward open science. It, it takes time, so you need to be rewarded for that. Uh, acknowledge a broad range of research integrity, also societal outreach and so on and so forth. Uh, and recognize essential other tasks like I alluded to, peer review, pre-publication peer review, post-publication peer review, and most importantly, mentoring. This is the report of the uh, Global Research Council I, I already alluded to. Um, you, you may recognize a name you know, um, Gansen Pillay, he's from the NRF in, in South Africa. Um, it, it is being, as, as we speak, it's being discussed during the, the conference of the Global Research Council. And it's, it sends basically the same message we, we have been discussing uh, together today. Um, th this is a nice tool uh, that is added to our Hong Kong principles. And, and if you like the Hong Kong principles, you can endorse them uh, on, on the website of the World Conference on Research Integrity Foundation. Uh, and what I like is, is the table of indicators of responsible research practices uh, to make it more measurable. And, and yes, to quantify it a little bit as well, because we, we well, personally, I like numbers more than letters as well, and, and that's the case with many people. Uh, so uh, you can change the game uh, without leaving numbers and indicators, uh, we believe, and we make some uh, proposals on that. Um, Research climate, I, I alluded to that already several times. It, it is very important, I believe. We, we did a study among the two Amsterdam universities, uh, not all on this uh, canal, of course, um, and, and the two university medical centers. Uh, 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 on one article I alluded already to, that's the publication pressure article. The other one is the article on the research integrity climate. Um, there is a wonderful welcome uh, trust uh, report of a few months ago on the same thing, culture, climate. I consider that as, as being synonyms. Uh, uh, and, and that means that there's room for improvement there as well. Um, what we found, for instance, is the following. Um, junior researchers perceive the research integrity climate much more negative than senior researchers. Junior researchers, they say that their supervisors are not that committed to fostering research integrity. Especially PhD students, they see around them a lot of competition and even suspicion among colleagues uh, higher in, in the tree than, than they are. And everyone is higher in the tree than they are, of course. The natural sciences, they seem to be on the average more positive about research integrity climate and especially the social sciences and the humanities, they perceive less fairness in publishing and acquiring funding. So yes, there is room for improvement and, and it has a lot to do with supervision. I haven't showed you these studies. There are many studies showing that probably the best intervention we can do is to give to improve supervision of PhD students and, and also postdocs. And we started pilot courses. Um, in, in this pilot courses, we offer a supervision uh, course, uh, three days and intervision and supervision in between uh, for people who get their first PhD student. Uh, they might be insecure, they might be willing to learn still. And we made a mix of the usual stuff in supervision courses on, on, on how to give feedback constructively and so on and so forth. And also open science. How do you do that? Uh, how you prepare a, a, a preprint, uh, how you upload a, a pre-registration and so on and so forth. It was very successful and it's now part of the mainstream of our university is, is being offered on a regular basis. And we even are so, so courageous to start offering a, a shorter course for uh, more senior PhD supervisors. Um, because we noticed that they have no clue what all these open science modalities are. 
and 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 why they are important for for the early career uh, researchers and how they can stimulate their PhD students to engage in in these uh, e excellent quality driven uh, innovations. So it's it's still early. Uh, we, we don't have a really sound evaluation material, but the process evaluation was was helpful. Let me say it that way. <coughs> This is a paper in Nature of a few weeks ago, uh, and in this paper, I'm not going to go through all, all this stuff, uh, we try to summarize what universities can do to improve the research integrity climate. Um, it, it, it will be familiar uh, on most angles. I've been talking about it this morning on, on several elements of it. Uh, uh, many of the stuff mentioned is in place already um, in Stellenbosch uh, in, in, in more or in lesser extent. Eh? Also, you can improve, all universities can still improve. Um, so we want to give inspiration. It's coming from a European project called SOPS for RI, Standard Operating Procedures for Research Integrity. And we are filling a toolbox, a toolbox with checklists, examples, standard operating procedures, guidelines, best practices, you name it, to inspire university leaderships and, and departments of, of uh, uh, research support in universities to have a research integrity promotion plan with all the nuts and bolts in place. Uh, it, it is heavily uh, sponsored by the European Union, this project. It's a large consortium. Um, and in the next round of EU grants, um, it, it will be an obligation for every university and other research institution accepting money from the EU to have a working uh, and alive and well-evaluated research integrity promotion plan in place. Um, and, and we are in this project um, in the happy position to be able to uh, collect the inspiration for that. This is the summary of my talk and, and, and that is where I more or less will end and then we'll have a few minutes left. Uh, I'm alluded to a number of actions you, you, you can take to improve a research integrity climate, pre-registration and residence reports, journals should more often demand it, Institutes should reward it and researchers should just, just do it. Open data, demand, reward and comply. It's easy. Preprints make it possible. Still a few journals forbid it, but most uh, allow it nowadays, but maybe promote it even. Um, it should be rewarded when you assess investigators, I believe, and researchers should just, just do it. Retractions, act fast for journals. Don't resist when uh, on good grounds one of your papers need to be rejected and institutions inform them when there is an ongoing research. It doesn't need to be finalized. Inform journals to retract at once as it is clear that the track record is polluted. Self retraction more or less the same peer review. Um, it's 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 important um, that it's being rewarded as well pre and publication peer review that needs to be encouraged more maybe and rewarded as well in the scheme of, of evaluating researchers. Predatory journals, I, I have alluded to that only a little bit. They should be closed down. Uh, researchers should stay away from them uh, and institutes should not reward but punish people who are using predatory journals. And then there are the perverse incentives that have been mentioned. Uh, they should be ignored as, as much as possible and institutions should remove them. I can say it shorter as well. Journals should adapt the transparency and openness practice guidelines. Institutes should follow the Hong Kong principles, I believe, and researchers should go for journals and research in, uh, institutes that do so. Finally, my publicity for the World Conference. It will be in Cape Town in, in uh, May uh, and June 2022. Uh, we needed to delay it with one year, as, as, as some of you might know. Uh, on the original date, we will have a series of really interesting webinars. Um, it will be uh, announced end of January, uh, January on, on, the, on the website of the 7th World Conference. Uh, 
you can also find interesting stuff on the website of the uh, World Conference on Research Integrity Foundation, and there you find all the stuff on on the the Hong Kong principles I have been alluding to. Um, having that said, that I believe I should close my presentation and give the opportunity for the last round of comments. Thank you, Prof. Um, colleagues, uh, yes, so this is now the last opportunity for a few questions. And we've got uh, the first colleague, uh, is it Panagiotis? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Bauter, for your uh, presentation. One short question uh, with regards to the uh, retraction section of your lecture. Uh, do we have any kind of tool to assess how detrimental the effect uh, in a paper uh, has uh, if it has cited a retracted paper before or after its uh, retraction because we might have the need if the effect is so detrimental to also retract the paper that has cited a retracted uh, um, uh, publication despite the fact that its authors would very would be very honest and very uh, accurate in their methodology thank you yeah it, it's a really good question panagiotis um, 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 and and the, the, the honest answer is that that I don't know that type of research. I would love to see it. And and yes, you're right, of course. But once a paper is rejected for what reason or the other, uh, it's bad practice to cite it afterwards, and that can be checked. But but your question is, wh what about the papers that cite that flawed paper before it has been retracted? Is there a way to clean the record there as well? Now, in paper publications, there is no way, but when you do it, ideally, like F1000 research, I've been alluding to, you, you can do versioning. You do, you, ideally, you, you should get um, a, a prompt. Hey, listen, you, you cited the paper that was later retracted. Please have another look at your paper and see whether what you say is still valid. And if not, do a new version of that paper. That will never happen in the paper journal, but but in the digital space, when when you have a rhythm of versioning, uh, like F1000 Research and a few more outlets are having that, that is a theoretical possibility. I must say I've never seen it happen, uh, but it might already uh, being happened, and I know no research that is studying that. Uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, Whitney, can I check? Do you have anything in the chat line? No question, Marika. Nothing, right. Colleagues, uh, perhaps one more question before we close off. If anyone, if anyone has a burning question, but I'm sure, Prof. Lex, you are uh, available to answer more questions via email, perhaps afterwards. Um, I know you are uh, keen to uh, continue the discussion with colleagues, so um, on your behalf, I'm now I'm now also extending the invitation for people to communicate with you further on this matter um, after this meeting. Yeah, well, th thank you very much for, for for having me here. And and yes, uh, well, within capacity, of course, I'm 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 willing to take questions by by email. And and let me repeat that the PDF of the presentation uh, will be sent around. Uh, and there are a lot of references and additional remarks uh, in, in the PDF, so that that might answer your question to some extent as well. Absolutely, and we will also send the recording of um, this webinar to participants as well, So, and it will also be available on uh, the Stellenbosch University website and via uh, the Serima communication platforms. Um, so together with the PDF, you will also receive um, the formal recording. Um, if there's no questions at this stage, I'm going to hand over to uh, Dr. Terina Tron just to do a short closing. Thank you very much.